The lands between are dominated by the Erd Tree and its god Queen Marika in most recent times. Marika and her royal family had wrested control of the lands between through military might, culminating in the massacre of the fire giants and the containment of their ruinous flame. However, there were one people that the Erd Tree forces were never able to overcome, not through strength of arm at least, and I am of course referring to the Kingdom of Liurnia, led by the powerful Carrion royal family. In the end, these two houses would join via the marriage of Radigan and Renala, producing some of the most powerful demigods of an age. Yet the truce of the Erd Tree House and the marriage of Radigan and Renala is just the tail end of their story. When we examine the Carrions, we can see there's an august history of a fascinating family that transformed the power dynamics of Liurnia and the greater lands between. So in this lore video, we will be examining the story of the Carrion Dynasty from astrologer roots to lunar monarchy and its eventual collapse. And at this stage I would like to thank Loki, translator and author of Abyssal Archive, for providing their translations and insights throughout which I will reference. But before we get started, remember that if you like Elden Ring lore, then consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video, as I have hours and hours of lore content for you to enjoy. The story of the Carrion starts where most of Magic's story in the Lands Between begin, on the mountain tops of the Giants, where a fledgling society of astrologers first lived in years past. Renala is referred to as an astrologer in the Stargazer Heirloom, which is how we know that she is descended from them. Chronologically, we first hear of the existence of these astrologers via the Sword of Night and Flame, a relic of the Carrions, which reads as follows. Storied Sword and Treasure of Carrion Manor Astrologers who preceded the sorcerers established themselves in the mountain tops that nearly touched the sky and considered the fire giants their neighbours. Notably, this sword is also described as a treasure of the Carrions and it's found in Carrion Manor, reinforcing the fact that they do owe their lineage to these early astrologers and they honour it, a fact reinforced by the description of the preceptor set as well. We find evidence of this old society in the stone basins and the stargazer ruins found on the mountaintops, the latter of which was presumably their home. Going by the account given in the sword, these astrologers lived peacefully in the mountains alongside the fire giants, meaning the development of this proto liurnian society very much predates the Erdtree Dominion. I presume most are aware of this, but for those who aren't, these early stargazers are the ancestors to the Glintstone Sorcerers, as is said in the sword description we just read, but it's also reinforced via the Carrion Preceptor set, which reads the following. A long, bright blue gown with the movements of the stars drawn upon it, worn by the magic preceptors who served the Carrion Royals. Glintstone Sorcerers are the descendants of astrologers, a fact that the Carrions remain aware of, even if their fate has long been severed from the stars. It is very interesting to me that the Carrions do have this habit of remembering and lauding their ancestry, no doubt a practice enforced by Renala, who herself was an astrologer. And of course, recording and preserving one's lineage is important for monarchies in the real world as well. Of course, the other reason the Carrions still likely care about astrology is that they are fully aware of how important fate is, especially to them. The stars alter the fate of the Carrion royal family, and the fate of your mistress Rani. My understanding of the settlement of Liurnia and Rhea Lucaria is that Rhea Lucaria predates the rise of the Carrions as a royal family, and they developed independently of one another. I mainly take this from the specific wording of her remembrance, which reads the following. In her youth, Ranala was a prominent champion who charmed the academy with her lunar magic, becoming its master. She also led the Glintstone Knights and established the House of Caria as royalty. The fact she made this discovery in her youth and then charmed the academy reinforces the idea that the Real Akarian Academy was already an established facility by the time Renala came to prominence. And indeed momentarily we will examine the history of Real Akaria which predates the rise of Caria when we look at founding OG members like Lusat and Azur. But returning to the Carrion Preceptor set, 
The astrologers are the ancestors of those who have become glintstone sorcerers. The sorcerers we find in Rhea Lucaria. And so we do have to fill in the gap a little bit when it comes to the transition from this astrologer society on the mountain to the glintstone sorcerers of the Liornian Basin. However, it is clear that in time the descendants of astrologers moved from the study of the sky to the study of glintstone, a material which makes one's position relative to the sky less of a pressing issue. Indeed, if you take a look at Liornia's landscape, we can see that it is a huge source of glintstone, both above ground and beneath it, and thus it makes sense that these adherents of the stars would gravitate towards this region. Indeed, even now, a glintstone mine lies underneath Rhea Lucaria, in the form of the Academy Crystal Cave, and as we learn from the Shatter Earth sorcery description, glintstone mining is very central to their culture, it is the foundation of it, with the failures of the Academy still being useful to that ecosystem by doing the dangerous job of mining glintstone that can be studied by their betters. And while the glintstone sorcerers are the descendants of astrologers, there has to be some overlap. The astrologers didn't completely cease to be, although their community on the mountaintops does seem to have been a thing of the past. As I said earlier, it seems that Renala was still part of an astrologer community, even after Rhea must have been established, because in her youth she meets her moon, and then not long after she goes to the academy and charms it. Renala's early history as part of this astrologer community, and her meeting the moon that would change her life, is best explored by the item Stargazer Heirloom, which reads the following. The young astrologer gazed at the night sky as she walked. She had always chased the stars every step of her journey. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen. The obvious conclusion that we have to come to then, with this overlap, is that Renala's community was either the last to come down from the mountaintops, or was simply the last to give up that way of life, whilst others had long become glintstone sorcerers. Loki has an interesting perspective on this gradual migration from the mountaintops, something shown by this map here. Loki believes that we can trace the migration pattern of the astrologers through the trees, the suggestion being that each migration of astrologers brought large conifers with them to their new home. We can see these ghost conifers on the mountain tops of the giants, the astrologer's original home. We can also see dead ones at Lascar Ruins in South Liurnia, where they clearly migrated to, and in Celia, and of course Moonlight Altar, where the Carrions would eventually migrate to. We can also find them in the area around the Shifra River, and in the Hallow Horn Grounds which lie above the Shifra River. Given that both of these areas surround the city of Nokron, Loki suggests that the conifer's presence here is because of a contact between Celia and Nokron, which we of course know exist, given Celia's deep ties to the Eternal City and the Nox. My main issue with this is that I personally see Celia as more culturally Nox or Numen, though I believe Loki isn't discounting this either. Rather, Loki sees the town of Celia as the result of a sort of cross-pollination, that astrologers settled down here in Caelid and made contact with the Nox. And while the establishment of Celia above ground is definitely because of the Noxian influence, he believes that the population here are mainly astrologer descendants, and I do think this certainly makes sense given that we only see two true Nox in this town, and the rest appear like normal glintstone sorcerers. But I really like this theory of Loki regarding the conifers and the migration patterns of the astrologers, and I think it helps illustrate the evolution of the astrologer community to their glintstone descendants via conifers that are primarily found on the mountaintops of the giants, but also these conifers are found in areas related to glintstone sorcery, such as Moonlight Altar, Lascar Ruins, and Celia. But to conclude, whilst a lot of her astrologer kin had already become glintstone sorcerers, Renala was still part of the astrologer tradition, but once again I think Loki puts it in a more concise way, and so once again I will quote Loki's notes to me on this subject. The Carrions are still living on the mountaintops during Renala's youth and migrate down while she is still relatively young. The Ulaskyar and Celia already have a lengthy history, with the Academy under Azur and Lusat. In short, they establish themselves as nobles on the western mountain and become royalty within a short number of years. But the power dynamic would shift when she met this cosmic entity, the Full Moon, that would come to define her and her rule henceforth.
So as we've just learned from the Stargazer heirloom, as a young astrologer, Renala was essentially observing the stars, and at this point she made contact with the moon. Where this fateful meeting took place, for me, is most likely to be Moonlight Altar, mainly because the location has a deep connection to the moon specifically. Despite this altar not being the highest point in the lands between, one is able to see the moon far more clearly than in any location. A place where we can see the full moon and the dark moon in the sky simultaneously, unlike in other areas of the map, even just below us in Liurnia, which means it most likely has a special connection to the moon. And if this was where Renala first made contact, it would make sense that this was where a moonlight altar would be established. We learn that Renala tries to recreate her own meeting with her moon with her daughter Rani, and this is something we learn of via Rani's Dark Moon, which reads as follows. This moon was encountered by a young Rani, led by the hand of her mother, Ranala. What she beheld was cold, dark, and veiled in occult mystery. Given that the full moon is foundational to Ranala's power, and she sees Rani as her heir, this makes total sense. But returning to Moonlight Altar, given it is one of the only places in the lands between, that we can see the dark moon and the full moon in the sky simultaneously. It does lead me to believe that this is where Renala led Rani to meet her own moon, and it is where originally Renala met her moon. With that in mind, let us consider the archaeology of Moonlight Altar and what it can tell us about the early history of the Carrions. Firstly, there are two sets of ruins that can be found on the altar in the shadow of the cathedral the Lunar Estate and the Moonfolk Ruins. As I stated in my Hidden Tales video, I attribute the Lunar Estate to be the estate of the Carrion family, prior to them living in Carrion Manor. The term estate in the real world, in Britain, is usually used to denote land owned by a royal or aristocratic family, and so I see this as the old Carrion Estate, the Lunar Estate. The Stargazer heirloom states that in time, Ranala became a queen, and given she was very young when she met the moon, it is a reasonable assumption that a good deal of time passed between her meeting the full moon and establishing the Carrions as a royal family. She would attend the Rhea Lucaria Academy as a young sorceress, charm them with her unique magic, and then in time build up her power base, before eventually declaring herself as monarchy, when she had enough power of course. And the foundation of that power, I think, can be found here in the Moonlight Altar. And as such, I would imagine this lunar estate to be her family's home during this transitionary period, established at the site of the most important meeting of her life. Likewise, I would see the Moonfolk Ruins as the ruins of a community who followed Renala and joined her in the veneration of the moon. There is another feature of interest to this story, found on Moonlight Altar. And this is what I call the Three Sister Statues, which are guarded by a Red Wolf of Radigan. Now, we are never directly told what these statues represent, but the statues of the three female figures immediately makes me think of the Three Sisters found at Caria Manor. These towers are called Rena, Rani, and Selvis's Rise. Selvis's Rive is clearly named after the current occupant. However, given this area is called the Three Sisters, I speculate that this is only a recent renaming of the tower, and that at one stage it was also named after a female. Therefore, speculatively, there might have been three sisters, of which Rani was just one, multiple Carrion princesses. Indeed, the description of the Carrion filigree crest does imply there were multiple Carrion princesses, and while it is speculation, I do think this is the story that is being told to us through the environmental details and it's just another tie to the Carrions, suggesting that this was their earlier home, predating Caria Manor. Then of course we have the cathedral, the Manus Celeste itself, and as Xylestorm points out in his video on Moonlight Altar, this cathedral shares the same architectural design as the Church of Vows, marking it as a Carrion structure, really being the final piece of evidence that Moonlight Altar is Carrion. The translation of the Latin Manus Celeste that people have provided within the community does vary, but the two most likely translations are the Hand of God or Hidden Hand. The cathedral itself is shattered, 
and spread throughout the ruined fragments of the cathedral or starlight shards. Additionally, in the sky we can see blue streaks, suggesting that Starfall has damaged the cathedral here, and this is something suggested by Xyostorm. And while I agree that the cathedral itself was damaged by a Starfall, I don't agree with the common notion that the two fingers found beneath the cathedral came down as a sort of meteor, and people usually cite the different blue colourisation of these fingers and the blue streaks in the sky as evidence for this. One of my main reasons for not agreeing with it, and again this is pointed out by Xyostorm in his video, is that the crater or channel that leads down to the two fingers is not a straight up and down line. The passage that leads to the two fingers under here actually travels horizontally a fair bit, and so if it was a straight meteor site, you'd think it would just be a straight up and down channel. And more importantly, I think the name of the cathedral, the Hand of God or Hidden Hand, is actually named after the two fingers, meaning it is built after the two fingers arrived here, and this would discount the notion that the two fingers sort of crashed through the roof of the cathedral because I don't think it would have been built until after the two fingers had appeared. So if the cathedral was built in honour of the two fingers as I'm suggesting, this really clashes with Rani's future view of the two fingers and the greater will. Rani would later come to despise her connection to the fingers, but perhaps at the time it was a cause of celebration for the Carrions. After all, their heir, their princess, had just been granted Imperian status. There is one other fact of importance that is relevant when discussing Moonlight Altar and this early community of the Carrions, and that is the connection to the Eternal Cities, specifically Noxtella. The passageway that now acts as the den of the fearsome Astel is sealed with the seal of the Carrions, marking it as their passageway, and this passageway ultimately acts as an underground highway to Noxtella. And this makes sense because the Eternals and the Carrions do have some cultural overlaps, most overtly seen in the Church of Vows. This church literally houses statues that can also be found in the Eternal Cities, but more importantly, the actual main function of this church is the Basin, and this is actually a statue of a Noxian swordstress, and it requires you to use Celestial Dew, and as the description of the Celestial Dew tells us, this is an invention of the Nox. And so this absolutely speaks to contact between the Carrions and the Nox, and is a nice detail when looking at their cultural and ideological development, as the tunnels at Moonlight Altar that lead to the Eternal Cities speak to this sort of contact. So to summarise, I see the Moonlight Altar as the first bastion of Carrion influence, when they were more concerned with the power of the moon, and before they became associated with Erdtree royalty. As for why they abandoned this significant location, well there are a couple of speculative ideas that I have. Firstly there is the possibility that this region became less significant and more isolated as the land in Laernia fell away. After all, we're only able to actually access this area by passing through the Eternal Cities, there is no direct route for Laernia, and as someone who is the monarch of Laernia, Basing yourself in a location that can't even access the lands that you rule is really not a strategic advantage. And so perhaps when the lands fell away and the Lake of Laernia was created, the Carrions looked for a new location from which to rule from. It could also be a shift in priorities. When she got married to Radigan and they had children together and her alliance with the Erdtree family obviously strengthened, perhaps she was less concerned with her old ways of venerating the moon and she cared more about maintaining her alliance and her marriage, and Caria Manor's location is definitely closer to Altus Plateau, and if there was an ongoing alliance between these two houses, it would make sense to relocate somewhere closer to Altus Plateau. So while we've discussed Ronala's consolidation of a power base, we also need to talk about her influence in another area, and this is of course in Rhea Lucaria, a institution that she would come to dominate, and is definitely one of the pillars of her rule, so let's talk about that. As we've already mentioned, Ranala was able to charm people at the Rhea Lucaria Academy because of her unique magic, and when you look at the history of sorcery in the Lands Between, this certainly makes sense, because Ranala's moon magic would have been like nothing anyone had seen before. 
The Lazuli Conspectus Mask, which represents the school that was founded to study carrying magic, shines a light on this. As it reads, Scholars of the Lazuli Conspectus study carrying sorceries, a heterodox pursuit that views the moon as equal to the stars. So this means that moon magic is unorthodox, and it was no doubt this unique nature that led to Renala becoming so prominent to the stage where she is honoured in paintings alongside other alumni. It's not just the uniqueness of her magic though, Renala is of course a very competent sorceress in other regards. A point well made by Loki in his notes to me is that Renala in stage 2 of her fight with us, which is presumably Rani recreating her glory days, she is able to use Azur's Comet, showing that while she eventually banned the primeval sorcerers from the academy, she was certainly capable of using their most powerful spells. And so with the combination of her raw talent and this unique type of sorcery that clearly blew away the academy and revolutionised its way of thinking, it's no surprise that she would become governess of the academy, a fact we can learn from Marielle, who names her as such. Renala and her brand of carrying magic eventually claiming dominance over the academy had quite a few consequences. Firstly, of course, it is definitely a huge win for her. It is a consolidation of power, and no doubt helped her legitimacy when she established herself as royalty. And we will learn about other things that she did to consolidate her power base in the next chapter, when we look at her forces and allies. But of course, claiming dominance over the academy is a massive feather in her cap. But of course, it would gain her enemies, as there must have been an existing power structure in the academy before Renala took full control. Because while Renala became the sole governor or ruler of Rhea Lucaria, it seems that before her, there were Grand Masters. A term coined in the robes of Azur and Lusat, two sorcerers that she would ultimately oust. It is of course Renala who dismantled the power base of those known as the primeval sorcerers. Something we can learn via Selin's personal enmity of the Carrions. If you recall... I was exiled from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It was for attempting to restore the primeval current of Blinstone sorcery. The toothless pedantry peddled by the Carian royal family can rot for all I care. I want Glinstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos. Even to this day, the Carians are still trying to wipe out this school of sorcery because Selen is being hunted by Jaren a retainer of the Carrions, and presumably the one responsible for chaining up her true body in the Witchbane Ruins, no doubt intending to return the moment the star started moving again and she could be killed for good. And while Selen is the most recent heir of this school, she isn't the one that founded this. In fact, this can be traced back to two of the oldest Glintstone sorcerers in existence, Lusat and Azur. I need your help, my apprentice. Master Lusat is another founding Glinstone sorcerer, and like Master Azure, he was banished from the Academy. Now he languishes in prison somewhere. My apprentice, can you find Master Lusat? With this Glinstone key, you should be able to cross the boundary that encloses him. I need him to restore the primeval current of Glinstone sorcery. He's nigh a child of the stars, such is his body now. Renala's reasons for banishing this school of sorcerers is never explicitly stated. However, as always, we are able to speculate with the evidence given to us. Firstly, the methods used by Selen and her predecessors are extremely dangerous and pretty abhorrent. And this is of course how Selen earned her moniker, Selen the Graven Witch. The term Graven is a reference to the so-called Graven Schools or Graven Mass, a horrifying abomination that we can learn of via the Graven Mass Talisman, which reads, The primeval current is a forbidden tradition of glintstone sorcery. To those who cleave to its teachings, the act of collecting sorcerers to fashion them into seeds of the stars is but another path of scientific inquiry. We can find these horrifying abominations throughout the lands between, tortured beings, and we can even find a dead one in Rhea Lucaria itself, in a room where we find Azur's staff, suggesting that he created one within the halls of the Academy itself. Imagine bonding humans together into this Frankenstein ball, within the very halls of the Academy itself, 
this no doubt would have caused a lot of discord and resentment. Indeed, the dialogue from Top suggests that Selin's expulsion from the Academy was indeed tied to her graven habits. Selin was well known. The most promising sorceress in the history of the Academy. I followed her at school. But there may as well have been an ocean between us. But Selin was expelled from the Academy, accused of unthinkable treatment of certain sorcerers, under the name of the Graven Witch. I still don't believe the accusations. The illustrious Selin would never do such things. Seems pretty straightforward. However, I do think there is another consequence of exiling these sorcerers, and that is that Renala got rid of some potential political opponents and solidified her control over the Academy. Selin describes both Lusat and Azur as founding Glintstone sorcerers, heavily implying that these sorcerers are some of the OGs, sorcerers who not only helped found Rhea Lucaria, but helped build the foundations of Glintstone sorcery itself. Indeed, this seems more or less certain when we consider the Carolus Crown, which names this school as the oldest, and this school was founded by none other than Azur. So we really are talking about the old guard here, legends who helped build the very foundations of the academy and sorcery in general. To reinforce their prestigious position that they once held, we can look to their robes, which read the following. Since the Grand Masters Azur and Lusat were driven from the academy, no one has achieved their formerly held rank. So Azur and Lusat were Grand Masters, a position which hasn't been held since they were expelled, and this makes sense if it coincided with Renala taking control as governor, a position that essentially made the role of Grand Masters worthless, and it changed the control of the academy from an oligarchy of these OGs to an effective monarchy. Rhea Lucaria thus transformed under Renala. Her school of magic, her brand of magic, would become its own conspectus, the Lazuli. Founding your own school is really the mark of being a great sorcerer, and again, the fact that she is able to do this with her own unique brand of sorcery would definitely have helped solidify her claim to governess of the academy. Selin describes Carrion magic as toothless pedantry, a reflection of the fact that under her rule, under Renala's rule, there was no research into the primeval current, which people like Selin see as the ultimate end goal of Glintstone sorcery as a whole, and thus practicing magic without this end goal in mind is toothless. And so with this clash in ideals and the political aspect of it, it is no wonder that Renala would get rid of these sorcerers from the academy, and with it, her control was secure. I had previously mentioned that Renala did other things to build up her power base, all of which would culminate in her being able to declare herself as a queen, and her house as a monarchy. And so in this chapter, let us discuss Caria as a royal house and what its makeup is. Renala founded the house as royalty, and so at this point I do want to tackle one of the weird parts of the lore, something I've talked about in my previous videos, and that is the fact that when Rani conjures the vision of Renala that we fight in the stage 2, she refers to Renala as the last queen of Caria. And this is a little strange given that she's the only queen of Caria, she's the founding queen, but Rani's language on a surface level seems to suggest that she is the end of a long line. However, once again, Loki was able to provide me with an answer that I find quite satisfying. Loki believes that Rani's word choice here is a reflection of Rani's view of the Carrion monarchy and her place within it. Loki points to the ghost found in Caria Manor, the ghost of a Carrion retainer or knight, and its dialogue belays a certain expectation among Carrion retainers that Rani would take the throne, so to speak. This expectation isn't particularly surprising given all we have discussed so far. Rani was clearly being groomed as the heir to Renala's throne. And so Loki suggests that this statement by Rani, that Renala is the last queen of Caria, is a reference to the fact that Rani has no intention of becoming the queen of Caria. Rani has her own path, which goes far beyond being a queen. 
and as such her mother, is the only true queen of the Carrions, the last. With that said, let us now look at the forces that are under Rinala's command. And I think what is interesting about the Carrion Royal House when compared to the Erdtree Royal House is the way that it enforces loyalty. The Erdtree House very much did it through conquest, whereas the Carrion House and its vassals are more closely bound through oaths of loyalty and chivalric values. The mainstay of Carrion forces is of course the legendary Carrion Knights, that numbered only a few, something we learn of via the Carrion Knight Sword, which reads, These Knight Swords could serve as catalysts, letting them wield a sorceress battle skills. Despite numbering fewer than 20, this power made them a match for even the champions of gold in battle. So these knights are few in number but very elite, and given the council chamber seen at the top of Carrier Manor, it suggests that they served as a sort of council as well, although that is just my speculation based on roundtable culture. The Carrion Knights also welcome trolls into their rank, as evidenced by Bowles, the Carrion Troll Knight, and the unnamed Carrion Troll Knight found in Carrier Manor. This is a marked difference from how the majority of trolls are used in the lands between, as the degenerate cousins of the giants and hated enemies of the Erdtree realm they are generally used as slaves or manual labour. However, the Troll Knights are treated with a sort of dignity, and the Troll Knight Sword item description highlights just how differently they were treated under the Carrions. As it reads, Called into service when the Queen invoked an oath they swore, the Trolls are treated as true Knights of Caria and fight arm in arm with their human comrades. So in this brotherhood, the Troll Knights are treated as equal to their human counterparts, and this makes sense as the Carrions would not have the same enmity for trolls that the Erdtree Royals would, because they didn't take part in that war. Indeed, if we remember the Carrions' origins as astrologers, both the ancestors of the Carrions and the ancestors of the trolls, the fire giants, coexisted in peace on the mountaintops. And so this partnership, this welcoming of trolls into the ranks of knights, is honouring that past. And so culturally, we can expect the Carrions to have a more even-handed view on giants and their kin. And because of this, they gained very powerful allies. Powerful knights that served with loyalty, but also gaining the guidance of the like of E.G. We learn via the Hammer item description that the art of smithing originated from the giants, hence why E.G. is such a skilled smith himself. Jaren even comments on how useful these weapons were in Redan's war against the Scarlet Rot. And funny thing, his swords were all blunt as stone, but not one of them decayed when faced with the Scarlet Rot. Again, just another powerful asset for the Carrion Royal House, an asset that would have been left on the table by the Erdtree because they view the trolls as nothing more than just slaves. And while the Erdtree forces clearly also arm trolls to be used as slave warriors, it's hard to compare them against the knightly trolls of the Carrion House who have been trained to use magic, and serve not because they are slaves, but because of a powerful oath. And something I missed but Loki picked up on, so again credit to Loki, is that Renala gathered other allies to her side through oaths as well. Loki highlighted the summons that Renala uses in stage 2 of her fight with us. Renala summons giants, dragons, and wolves, and each time she does so she says, Come Oath Sworn. So again, these aren't just slaves or summons, these are beings, animals, trolls, and dragons that have sworn an oath of loyalty to Renala that she then calls upon. So I think you're starting to get the picture that oaths are important to carrying culture. They didn't just want people to serve them, they wanted them to be bound to the Carrions through loyalty and oaths. The Troll Knight Sword that we looked at obviously tells us that these knights were bound to them by an oath, and this of course makes sense because they are essentially knights of this royal house, and in medieval history when you are a knight, you are indeed bound to your liege through oaths. The term oath is also used in regards to another Carrion vassal, Jaren, the Witch Hunter, and ally to General Radan. We can learn of this via the eccentric armor set, Jaren's set, which reads the following. Jaren preferred a nomadic existence, but after spending time as a guest of the Carrion Royals, he became a guest commander for General Radan, and for the first time, the restless tumbleweed 
would be bound by an honourable oath. These oaths are described as honourable, and they seem to have the effect of creating real ties of loyalty, especially when you consider what Jeren went through for the Carrions. He stood by the degenerating Redan for god knows how long. His dialogue that we quoted earlier, where he discusses Eiji's weapons, suggests he was actually serving by Redan's side during the war against the Scarlet Rot, and he even assisted in putting General Redan to his final rest, all the while while having Selen tied up so he could fulfil his real oath, which was to kill Selen. Now the festival is over, and General Radan is defeated, Jeren's duties are finally fulfilled. Though we served different masters, I could see he was truly adept in his role. Now the time has come to remind him of an old promise made. With the stars of fate set into motion, a certain sorceress is dispossessed of her immortality. Finally, we can be rid of a long-standing Carrion weed. Jaren is described in his armour set as someone who is a tumbleweed who doesn't want to put down roots, and yet because of the loyalty that the Carrions inspire, he did put down roots and went through great effort to fulfil his oath to the family. There is another rather interesting oath between the Carrions and another unusual ally, the Crystallians, and this is something we can learn of via the Magic Downpour item description, which reads the following. One of the sorceries of the Carrion royal family, said to have been taught by the Crystallians to mark the swearing of the Old Concord. As to what the details of this Concord was, we can only guess, beyond the fact Carrions were granted a deeper insight into magic directly from these unusual beings. We can also find Crystallians present in Moonlight Altar alongside dragons, again implying that Renala established these Concords early on in her rise to power before settling down in Caria Manor, and that she somehow bound these unusual beings to her service. Rani, as a Carrion princess, seems to continue this tradition of making her oaths with her vassals. This is most clearly seen in her relationship with her shadow, Blythe, and this is in many ways the greatest illustration of the loyalty that the Carrions inspired. As Blythe is already bound to Rani in a cosmic fashion, through the power of the Two Fingers. I was once an Empyrean, of the demigods. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers, as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe, in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean. And yet despite that, Rani still requires Blythe to take an oath, swearing loyalty to her not as an Empyrean, but as his liege. And we learn of this via the Royal Greatsword, which reads, In defiance of the fate he was born into, Blythe swore to serve no master but Rani. As proof, the sword was imbued with a cold magic at the moment the oath was sworn. Blythe literally ends up defying his own nature in favour of his loyalty to Rani, his words and his covenant with her more powerful than the cosmic forces of the world. The Carrions are even able to bind dragons to their will, as evidenced by Adula, the dragon that guards Rani. And we learn from Adula's Moonblade that this dragon is specifically tied to Rani. However, Renala also summons an oath-bound dragon during her stage 2 fight with us, implying that Renala also bound dragons to her service in the same way. And then when you look at Moonlight Altar and you see how densely populated it is with dragons, this makes sense. I've always assumed that these dragons found on Moonlight Altar, apart from Adula, are ones that the Carrions bound into their service. This sort of chivalric culture is the core of the Carrions' identity and is how they differ from the Erdtree monarchy. And as a result, while the Carrions probably don't have as big an army as the Erdtree forces, we can already see how they were able to put up such a fearsome fight. They had trolls, dragons, and soldiers willing to die for them, bound in a sort of loyalty that the archery forces could never know. Of course, we can't talk about the Carrion chivalric culture without discussing the most honourable knight in the lands between, Loretta. We learn about Loretta via her armour set, which reads the following. 
Loretta was once a royal carrion knight, and her lapsus lazuli blue cape is the emblem of the knightly pride that continues to guide her. Of course Loretta is no longer in service to the carrions, and we can see this from Loretta's war sickle, where her blue glintstone of the carrions has been replaced with the unallied gold of Mikola, marking her change of allegiance. However, as the armour set says, while she no longer serves the carrion house, the chivalric values that she learned under them is what guides her to be one of the most honourable people that we see in this game. I think it's greatly implied that Loretta somehow stands above the other carrion knights, as is evident by her more extravagant armour and armaments. And I've always assumed that the phantom version of Loretta we fight in Carrier Manor is a conjured version that Rani has made, showing how valued she still is even in her absence. And when fighting her it is clear to see why she would be so valued. She is extremely powerful, both in her martial prowess and her spellcraft, characterised by her fearsome magic bow. Yet Loretta of course is most well known for her quest to find a new home for the Albanorix. This is what leads her to the Halig Tree and her service to Mikla. Loretta's mastery tells us that she travelled long and far to find a home for the Albanorix, and given she is settled in the Halig Tree, changed her allegiance to Mikla, and we can find Albanorix in the consecrated snowfield, it's heavily implied that Mikla offered a safe haven for these Albanorix, and in return, Loretta gave him her loyalty. The consecrated snowfield became a sort of fabled land, a legend to the Albanoric people. A chosen land awaits us, Albanorix. The medallion is the key that leads to the city. It's only a quaint treasure for we who cannot make the journey. But for dear Latena, it is needed to fulfil her purpose. And this was all achieved by Loretta, who clearly showed great compassion to the Albanorix. Now, when it comes to the creation of the Albanorix, as you will see in my Nox and Albanoric lore videos, I am certainly of the mind that the Albanorix were originally created by the Nox, and I won't retread that entire video here, but a summary of my main reasons for believing so are as follows. The Nox have an obsession with creating a Lord of Night. There is a cut dialogue from Tops that directly states that the Albanorix are a creation of the Eternal Cities. The Nox are well versed in alchemy, as is evidenced by the Celestial Dew and the Puppet Draft. They've also worked with other silver beings, namely the Silver Tears, beings that can mimic things, again suggesting that these beings, these malleable creatures, were meant to create an artificial Lord of Night. There is a cut dialogue featuring a mimic tear called Asimi, who directly states that again these silver tears are creations of the Eternal City. And thus, with all this together, it isn't hard to believe that the Albanorix are another creation of the Eternal Cities, an artificial being created in the hopes of producing a Lord of Night. However, in that same video, I did also touch on another connection that the Albanorix have, the connection to Rhea Lucaria that goes beyond their heavy presence in this region. Zuli the Witch did a video in which they revealed the silver armour of the female Albanorix once had a different description pre-release. At one point, the item description of this silver armour attributed the creation of the female Albanorix to Rhea Lucaria, and I will let Passmo describe what my thoughts on this contradiction is. What is the truth behind their creation? Did the Nox create them, or was it a Rhea Lucarian or Carrion creation? Well, the balance of truth is for you to decide, but I believe both can be true. I do believe that they do originate from the work of the Nox. The evidence we looked at previously is too strong, and the thematics fit very well. However, it could have been expanded upon by Rhea Lucarians and Carrions. My belief is that the work did originate with the Nox as an experiment to create a Lord of Night, but that the Rhea Lucarians and Carrions may well have piggybacked off it in an attempt to create warriors and servants, and this would explain why there are so many Albanorix in Liurnia, specifically some serving the Carrion royal family. And I more or less stand by this, however since then my ideas on this have somewhat refined, especially in my discussions with Loki. Where I had previously stated that the Rhea Lucarian sorcerers may have just replicated this research one for one, Loki goes further to suggest 
that the female Albanorics specifically mark the real Akarian contribution to the research. The female versions are more sophisticated, being able to pursue combat in a way that the older ones are not able to, whilst also retaining their intelligence unlike the second generation or frog Albanorics, perhaps speaking to the fact that these are a second attempt or V2 and thus having more sophisticated results. I am now however going to directly quote Loki's reasoning on the matter as I find it quite compelling. Female Albanorics are both young, eloquent and uniquely given large wolves from mountaintops to ride. Same wolves, leftovers from halted experiments, are left wandering around Carrion Manor. In short, they are Carrion first generation built off Nox's previous experiments, or third generation Albanorics in general. Loretta learns from observing these adept wolf riding archers firsthand at Caria Manor. I'm leaning towards the Carrions and Rhea Lacarians picking up the work established by the Nox, and that the female version specifically may be a Rhea Lacarian or Carrion refinement on the same formula. But do you agree with Loki that Loretta is a human knight who learned combat style from the Albanorix and thus grew to pity them? Or do you think that Loretta is the combination? of the carrying refinement of the Albanoric formula, and that she is essentially the ultimate Albanoric. It is hard to discount the similar styles of combat, the horseback archery. Whatever you believe in the carrion or rail carrion involvement in the Albanorics, what is clear is that the carrions incorporated Albanorics into their service, as is evident by Pidia and other Albanorics found within Caria Manor. So now we can see why the carrions would have been such a formidable force when the Erdtree forces would attack. Not only were they led by the most powerful sorcerer of all time, who had united the entire lands of Liurnia under her control, but she had loyal elite knights, trolls, crystallians, and dragons all sworn to her service, never mind the resources of the academy and its sorcerers, as well as being led by Renala, the most powerful sorcerer of an age. Liurnia had developed into a real power with its own culture, and thus the stage would be set for the conflict that would become known as the Wars of Liurnia. So if you've seen my Elden Ring timeline video, you know that I generally place the Liurnian Wars as something that happened after the era of the Erdtree Conquest, that it happened quite a bit after the Wars with the Giant, after the Golden Order was firmly established. This would take a long time to fully explain once again, as I've done it several times, throughout my videos, and so I will go through my reasoning as fast as possible, so not to distract from the subject at hand. Firstly, the Liurnian Wars are not mentioned in Godfrey's armour set as one of his great conquests, nor is he even mentioned to have taken place in the Liurnian Wars, it's all Radigan, and this implies to me that this is deep into his reign as Elden Lord, a period where he has vowed to act more like a lord, thus Radigan a champion, is given command of the army. There is also the Barrier of Gold incantation, the description of which tells us that this was an incantation used specifically in the Liurnian Wars by Erdtree forces. The casting sigil of this incantation is the Celtic knot looking version of the Erdtree, the sigil still worn by modern Erdtree knights, again suggesting this war was waged at a time when Erdtree society had been allowed to mature. I also ascribe to the theory purported by Tarnished Archaeologist, wherein you can trace the evolution of Erdtree culture and history through the different classes of Erdtree miracles. If you weren't aware, there are three classes of incantations associated with the Golden Order and the Erdtree, and they apply a evolution of changing beliefs under the same system. These incantation categories are the Ancient Erdtree incantations, which include any to do with the Age of the Crucible or the Age of Plenty. Then there is the categorization of Erdtree Worship, which is what Barrier of Gold falls under. And then finally, there is the Golden Order Fundamentalists. And so given that the ancient Erdtree incantations represent the Age of Plenty and the Age of the Crucible, this must be the beginning of Erdtree culture. On the other side, we have the Golden Order Fundamentalist incantations, which are of course associated with Radigan Second Elden Lord's reign, so this is near the end of the timeline. And so in the middle, we have the Erdtree Worship incantations, to which Barrier of Gold belongs. 
And again, to me, this is strong evidence that the Ilionian Wars happened in the mid-period of Erdtree rule. I hope that makes sense, and if you want a deeper look at these ideas, I would recommend Tarnished Archaeologists' Creeds of the Erdtree video, from where I get this theory. And so let us return to the events of the Ilionian War itself, which we can therefore assume happened at the height of both the Erdtree and Liurnia's power. While the Erdtree forces were clearly going to be the dominant military force in the lands between, as we've discussed already, the Liurnian army was able to fight them to a standstill over two conflicts. We learn of this via the sword monument that details the Second War, which reads, The Second Liurnian War. No victory for the golden, nor for the moon. No prize but atonement, the birth of a vow. We can imagine the Carrions were able to hold back the much larger Erdtree armies through a few distinct advantages. Renala herself, who at this stage will have been the most powerful sorcerer in the lands between, the elite order of Carrion Knights and other oath-bound allies, and finally the defensive advantage. It wasn't one-sided of course, Radigan from the Erdtree armies in particular is noted to have covered himself in glory during these conflicts, as the sword monument for the first war states, the first Liurnian war, Radigan's glory burns as red as his hair. And so while we don't get any clear picture about the conflicts in this war, it was clearly a fearsome war between two kingdoms at the height of their power. And it speaks to the power and prestige of Caria and its royal house, given it was able to hold off this mighty empire by itself. Of course, Radigan and Renala would eventually make peace, peace that was secured through marriage. Radigan once cleansed himself with celestial dew, repented his territorial aggressions, and swore his love to Renala. The order of the Erdtree and the fate of the moon were conjoined, and all the wounds of war forgiven. Before we go any further, there is something really interesting in this dialogue. Muriel states that the order of the Erdtree and the fate of the moon were conjoined. The fact he specifically talks about fate being conjoined with order is fascinating to me. It makes me rethink some of my prior assumptions. The telescope item description reads as follows. During the age of the Erdtree, carrion astrology withered on the vine. The fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. I had always assumed that this was a reference to Radan halting the movement of the stars and arresting their movement, as we do know this does affect the fate of the Carrions, and we actually have to kill him in order to restart fate and free up Rani's fate. However, from this dialogue with Muriel of order and fate being conjoined makes me think that this union was something more than just a marriage between Renala and Radigan, that fate was also married to order, and that somehow it was restricted by order being imposed upon it. Astrology is really important to the Carrions, and this is denoted by the fact the Carrion preceptors seem to carry on the practices of their astrologer ancestry, and the fact that Renala was once herself an astrologer. And Selin's dialogue that we looked at earlier makes it clear how important fate is to the Carrions. But perhaps it was at this moment when fate was conjoined with order that the fate of the Carrions truly became restricted. Maybe it is little surprise that Rani despises the Golden Order so much and that she would strike out against them. Just something to think about when thinking about the wider consequences of this marriage. I really do love the lore significance of the Church of Vows. Marielle tells us that it was constructed at a specific point within Liurnia in order to have both sight of Rhea Lucaria and the Erd Tree, symbolically looking at the moon and the tree, representing the union of the house of the tree and the house of the moon. After the church was constructed, the marriage was prefaced with an old Noxian custom, the cleansing of oneself with celestial dew. I do think it's important to analyse what happened here, as it isn't merely a symbolic gesture, there is actually a power to this ritual. I have discussed this already in this video and in more detail in my Nox video, but the Nox essentially experimented with alchemy. We know that stars are tied to fate, something expressed by the Amber Starlight Shard item description and via Selin's dialogue on fate and the Carrion family. And thus to me, both the puppet drafts of the Nox and the Celestial Dew 
likely manipulate fate latent within the stars. For the puppet drafts, they shackle the fate of those who imbibe it, and in the case of the Celestial Dew, fate is rewritten, animosity forgotten. For example, if I attacked Blythe and killed him to get a dialogue for my lore video, he would resurrect and permanently be aggroed at me. However, if I cleanse myself with Celestial Dew, it's like he resets, almost as if he has forgotten our previous conflict, our fate has been realigned, and this enmity no longer exists. I wonder if this contributed to how strongly Renala felt about Radigan. It is clear that the relationship was initially political. In real history, often a pact of peace was solidified between kingdoms with a marriage between the houses, and Elden Ring is clearly no different. However, despite this, it is clear that there was some genuine affection between the two. Muriel describes how Radigan declared his love for the beautiful Full Moon Queen, and then Renala's armour set tells us how much she was devastated by him leaving her. So she must truly have been in love with him. But we will return to the collapse of the marriage at the end of this video. For now I want to talk about the marriage itself, as one of the more interesting points of lore within the entire story of Elden Ring comes up within their marriage, and this is the implication that Renala knew the truth of Radigan's identity, that he is Marika. I have discussed this in huge detail before, specifically in my Radigan lore video which I would refer you to, but I believe that Radigan was already Marika at the time of his marriage to Renala, and again my full thesis on that is in my Radigan video. However, for the purposes of this video, the main item of relevance is the Mask of Confidence, worn by the Carrion Preceptors. It reads the following, Mask with the mouth sewn shut with gold thread. When Radigan married Renala, he ordered the Carrion Magic Preceptors to don these masks, to make it clear that all of their matters were to be kept strictly private. So I know others have argued that the Preceptors are just keeping matters of state private, but come on, when we are talking about Radigan, there really is only one elephant in the room when we are talking about secrets. There is also the fact that when Radigan left Renala, he left her a fragment of the Elden Ring, the Amber Egg, as a parting gift. How would a mere champion gain access to the Elden Ring and take one of its runes? Well, the answer is he couldn't, unless he was also Marika, the god of the age who bore the Elden Ring. So it's quite interesting that the masks of the preceptors are not part of their original outfit, rather it's an affectation born of the Carrion's association with the Erdtree royalty. It means that Celavus was also potentially privy to the greatest secret of an era, just a nice little consideration. This also means that when Radigan and Renala had children they are true demigods, not just by virtue of Radigan's later marriage where they became stepchildren. Rykard and Radan's great runes say that they became demigods when they became the stepchildren of Marika through their father's second marriage. However, I just see this as a political excuse to cover the real truth, that they were actually demigods by virtue of their birth. During the marriage between Renala and Radigan, we can assume that this was a happy time for both, Renala being blessed with her different children, and grooming Rani to be her successor, and eventually they would relocate closer to the shores of Liarnia into Caria Manor, as we've discussed before, in an attempt not only to have a better, more strategic location, but also to strengthen the ties between these two kingdoms which had now been married into one another. And as prosperous as we can imagine this period to be, it obviously wasn't meant to last. In this chapter I do want to focus on the collapse of the Carrion household, and I won't be covering the children of Renala that much, as I already have full hour-long videos on Rykard, Radan and Rani, and I will link those below. However, in the context of the collapse of the house, I do think it's important that we cover some of Rani's lore. As I said in the previous chapter, I assume that Rani's meeting with the Dark Moon when she was young happened when Renala and Radigan were still together, because after Radigan leaves Renala, it appears that she's completely broken, and thus I would think incapable of introducing her to her Dark Moon. I would also assume that Rani meeting the Snowy Crone would take place after Radigan and Renala's marriage fell apart, and I think this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, let's look at two bits of lore that cover this facet of the story. Firstly, the Snow Witch set, which reads, Once worn by the Snowy Crone, who the young Rani encountered deep in the woods, she was a witch and well versed in cold sorceries. 
It is said that the doll that houses Rani's soul was modelled after her. That old witch was Rani's secret mentor. And now let's look at the description of the Freezing Mist spell, which reads, Sorcery said to have been used by the old Snow Witch. The Snowy Crone taught the young Rani to fear the Dark Moon, as she imparted her cold sorcery. So this mysterious witch became Rani's mentor, and part of my reason for it taking place after Rinala's fall is because maybe Rani needed a new mentor, a new mother figure. It is clear that this woman is important to Rani, considering she completely models her new form after this figure. Perhaps this was because this snowy crone was there for Rani when she needed someone, when she needed some guidance. Secondly, the freezing mist description tells us that it was this snowy crone who taught Rani more about the secrets of the Dark Moon. Again, this suggests to me that this took place sometime after that initial meeting with the Dark Moon, organised by Rinala. It's just that this snowy crone taught her the deeper secrets of the occult and the Dark Moon. Perhaps the fall of Rani's house, her father's abandonment of her mother in favour of the Erdtree Order, is what led Rani to choose a different path, resenting the Erdtree Order and all that it stood for. After learning the secrets of the Dark Moon, she would pledge herself to the Age of Stars and set herself on a path which would have lasting consequences for the Lads Between. But with that covered, we now need to talk about the main event that really heralded the end of the Carrion House as a serious power, Radigan's departure. We know from Marielle that Radigan's departure left Renala essentially devastated. The great and beautiful full moon witch. Sadly, her heart was broken when Lord Radigan left her. And then, when the Academy rebelled against the royals, she was locked away in the Grand Library. In the end, Lady Renala was left alone, cradling the amber egg Lord Radigan bequeathed her. Now she devotes herself to it through forbidden rite, the grim art of reincarnation. You would do well to remember, severing a vow, strongest of bonds, has consequences ever more dire. Indeed, this is how we see Renala now. Broken, kept in a sort of delusional slumber by the lullabies of her sweetings. As to why she creates such beings, it is again up to speculation. There's the possibility it is just loneliness, and that creating these beings gives her comfort, and she's just using the last tool that her beloved Radigan gave her. Especially when you consider it is their lullaby that keeps her suspended in this slumber. And us breaking this slumber is what causes Rani to intervene in the first place. Of course, Radigan's departure had more radical consequences than just breaking Renella's heart. It essentially led to the entire collapse of the Carrion royal family. Up until this point, and as should be made clear by this video by this point, the Carrion royal family's power was based around Renella. Not only through her unique and powerful sorceries, but through her general charisma and statesmanship. But with her basically out of action, enemies would now finally be able to act and bring down the hold that the Carrions had over Leonia. And we learn about the Rhea Lucarians essentially rebelling against Renala via her own robes, which read the following. When Renala, head of both the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and the Carrion royal family, lost her husband Radigan, her heart went along with him. And then, those at the Academy realised that Renala was no champion at all. In short, it was a moment of weakness that was exploited by those at the Academy. A chance to shake off her rule. Here was the powerful ruler that had dominated Lyernia and Rhea Lucaria for years, broken and weak. And so they locked her up in the Academy. But even with Renala out of the picture, the Carrion royal family had powerful retainers at their command, something we've already looked at. And so the Rhea Lucarians would need some muscle. And this is where the Cuckoos come in. The relationship between Rhea Lucaria and their soldiery, the Cuckoos, is described by the Rhea Lucaria soldier Ash, which reads the following. The soldiers of Rhea Lucaria were also known as the Cuckoos. They were given free reign by the Academy to wage war as they pleased, and they were infamous for their rapacious ways. The Academy had a sort of hands-off approach to controlling their armed forces. Indeed, this may be due to the fact that the relationship between the Academy and the Cuckoos was closer to that of a mercenary force rather than fealty. 
the Scholar's Armament spell reads the following. Taught to the Knights of the Cuckoo by the Academy as payment for their contract. So here we learn of a contract between the Rhea Lucarians and the Cuckoo Soldiery. And as such they were given free reign to wage war against the Carrions in any way they saw fit. A brutal war, we can assume, given the rapacious reputation of the marauding Cuckoo forces. However we of course know the Carrions are also brilliant strategists and so aside from their powerful knights and dragons and trolls, they also unleashed the puppets against these rebellious upstarts. And we can see this actually still happening on the eastern side of Lyurnia. Again just another benefit of their ties to the Noxian people. However as this war ended up in the Siege of Caria Manor, we can assume that the Cuckoos overwhelmed the leaderless Carrions and they were held up in the Caria Manor. However it was at this stage that the Carrions were able to get a bit of a win as the sword monument outside of Caria Manor reads the following. The resting place of the contemptible Cuckoos, lost in the siege of Caria Manor. Indeed in a dialogue, E.G. confirms that the Knights of the Cuckoo were essentially slaughtered during the siege of Caria Manor thanks to these magical traps, and no doubt a result of the defensive advantage that Caria Manor offered. Indeed we still see Cuckoo soldiers being used by Pidia or by Celevis as puppets within the manor. I can't imagine being captured by anyone worse than Celevis or Pidia, being forced to drink a puppet draught and being their little toy marionettes forever. Yet despite this, the Carrion's power was clearly broken during this war, as Lyurnia is quite clearly controlled by the Cuckoos now, as evident by their tents over the majority of its territory. Renala is locked away and any remaining Carrion forces have either scattered or are penned up in Caria Manor. Indeed, dialogue from Rogier suggests that the Carrions have been largely absent in the years past, only recently returning to the Caria Manor. I have some idea of Rani's potential whereabouts. There's a manor to the north of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It is the familial home of the Carian royals from whom Rani descends. There's been talk of the old royals' vassals gathering there in recent years. Rani's whereabouts since the shattering are a well-kept secret. She hasn't been seen even once, but I suspect she might have returned to the manor in which she was born. Suggesting that while the Carrions reaped a bloody toll during the siege of Caria Manor, this was essentially a victory for the Cuckoos. Rule under the Cuckoo in this area would be pretty brutal, especially for the Albanorix, as the Albanoric pot reads, The Knights of the Cuckoo do declare, Behold thy defiled blood, unlike any humour that flows in our grand realm. Suggesting that the Cuckoo don't even see the Albanorix as human, a sentiment shared by many, as is described by the Albanoric blood clot, the greatest lore item in the game. This is of course a stark contrast compared to Carrion rule. As we saw in the previous chapters, the Carrions would welcome almost everyone into their service as long as they would take an oath. Indeed we do have Albanorics still serving the Carrions now, and I can't help but wonder if the Albanorics under Carrion rule in Lyurnia were able to live in peace or relative harmony, and it is only recently under the rule of the Cuckoos and Rhea Lucaria that they've began to be hunted. The description of the Albanoric Silver Shield suggests that their main enemies are indeed sorcerers, suggesting they are often at odds with the Rhea Lucarians and their Cuckoo mercenaries. Indeed, armed bands of Albanoric second generations now control the area around Rhea Lucaria, where Academy Town used to be. And again, I can't help but think that everything was more harmonious under the rule of the Carrion royal family, and its collapse has had disastrous consequences for the unity of Lyurnia, making it a very unstable region, made only more unstable by the fire monks who have recently come down searching for the Thief of Fire, seeing their mission as paramount beyond any idea of nationality or sovereignty, and have thus occupied large swathes of Lyurnia as well. I think it's fair to say that the unity of Lyurnia has certainly receded. And indeed this might be the greatest legacy of the Carrions, is seeing how bad it is now in Lyurnia. We can only imagine how strong and prosperous a nation it must have been to be able to resist the advancing Erdtree Empire, and how unified and strong it must have been under Renala in her heyday. 
Ultimately, this is all that's left of the Carrion dynasty of old. Their queen locked up and broken. Their previous holdings broken and abandoned. The future of the Carrions lie with Rani, and while the splendour of the family is long since past, they may yet reach new heights, but it's clear they will never be what they once were. And having studied the Carrions for this video and understanding how they bound an entire region of the map together through ideals of oaths and loyalty, it makes the fractured and divided state of Lyurnia now all the more interesting. And while we are often blinded by the glory of the Erdtree royalty and their gods, it is actually the Carrions who really showed the lands between what it means to be noble. Thanks guys, that is my take on the Carrion royal family. A mighty house with loyal retainers that has ultimately crumbled into nothing. What are your thoughts on the Carrion royal family? Was there anything you think I missed or anything you disagreed with? Please let me know in the comments below as I do always love a good lore discussion. Otherwise, also let me know what you'd like me to cover next in my lore videos. I'm still planning to cover Elden Ring, but also Bloodborne and Dark Souls, so let me know if there's any subject that piques your interest. If you like this content and you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and liking this video as it helps me out a ton. But until next time guys, I will see you in the shattered remains of Moonlight Altar. Take care and have a wonderful night.